been a little while. I feel like there's been a, like, you know, you guys know that I've been going through our statement of faith, and uh, it's, it's time to get back onto that. Uh, so last week, um, obviously been, what is the date? Was it, wasn't New Year's, no, hold on. Wasn't New Year's, no, it wasn't. I wasn't here last, okay, that's what happened. I wasn't here last week. Well, I was in Sydney. That's what happened. And the week before that was New Year's Day, so I did a New Day's message. And before that was Christmas Day, so I did a Christmas Day message. Anyway, this is, so we're back on program now. We're going for our statement of faith, our, our doctrinal statement as a church. And if we look at Matthew 28, verse, uh, chapter, uh, verse number 18, Matthew 28, 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, This is the Great Commission. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And now we have three major parts that should make up every church. Every church. You know, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And of course, we know that this has to do with going and teaching the gospel, preaching the gospel to all nations. We've been given the privilege of being in Australia. We're to preach the gospel in Australia. Hey, and if the Lord sees fit and uses us to go to another nation, praise God for that. But number one, we see that our first job there is to go and teach all nations. Then it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the, of, the Holy, of the Holy Ghost. So the second part of the Great Commission is baptism. And the third part is, verse number 20, teaching them to observe all things, all things, whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We have a three-part uh, process there of the Great Commission. And today we're going to be looking at baptism. Today, uh, the title for the sermon this morning is baptism and it works out really well because we'll be doing baptisms after this service we've got three that are getting baptized if there's anyone else that needs to get baptized that has you know hasn't done it yet please let me know it's never too late okay you can just get you a towel and you'll be fine but uh baptism and i just just works out well because we are up to this topic when it comes to our statement of faith works out well that we have a few that needs to get baptized today now the reason we read that great commission uh, i just want to share with you like obviously all those things are important and you know verse number 20 that's my job as a pastor, to teach them to observe all things. You know, the goal that I have is to teach the whole Bible. You know, as long as God gives me life, as long as I have the mental capacity and the ability to preach God's Word, my goal is to teach you all things, okay? I don't really want to have a hobby horse. You know, some preachers have a hobby horse, and they keep hitting that same thing over and over and over again. I kind of just want to teach all things. Like, I want to be as balanced as I can as, as a preacher, and teach as often as the Bible teaches on certain topics. That's kind of my personal goal, to teach all things. You know, I don't want to hide anything from you. Uh, you know, if there's something in the Bible that might be a little bit offensive, if there's something in the Bible that society does not agree with, it doesn't matter. My job is to teach all things. That's part of the Great Commission. You know, if we have a church that's not teaching all things, they're not fulfilling the Great Commission. The other part, of course, part, the first part that we have there is go ye therefore and teach all nations. This is why the primary ministry of this church is the door-to-door ministry, the soul winning that we do right, on a regular basis. And, you know, the, the two things about the soul winning and the preaching and observing all things is that this gets done every week within our church. Right? Every week we're observing all things. Every week we're going out teaching all nations. But one thing that we don't do every week, of course, is baptizing okay and this is why for me the most exciting part of the great commission is is the, is the baptizing for me personally the, the, the most fun the most exciting part is because we don't do it that often okay we don't do it that often where someone believes in christ gets saved and then the next desire of course is to get baptized but it says there in verse number 20 go you therefore teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost and of course, name there, you know, often we talk about the word, the name, we, you know, you could say, is that a personal name? Of course, in this context, it's authority, right? If I do someone in the name of the, if I do something, like if an officer says to you, hey, stop in the name of the law, they're saying, hey, stop by the authority of the law. You know, if my children are doing something, they might say, hey, I'm doing that on the authority or by the name of my father. They're, someone that, they're doing that by that authority. When we do baptisms, we're doing it in the authority, in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy Ghost. You see here, we have, of course, the triune nature of God being revealed to us, having that great authority, giving us that authority to go and preach the gospel, giving us the authority to do baptisms, giving us the authority to observe all things, which makes all sense because in in verse number 28, Jesus Christ says that all power is given unto him in heaven and in earth. But one thing that I really love at the end of verse number 20, it says, And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. I am with you all way. You know, something that I've taught in the past in the King James Bible, sometimes it's translated all way, sometimes it's translated 
uh, always, you know, you read, all, obviously, uh, we don't use always in our modern day vernacular, right? We use always for all things, but they're actually quite different. Always has to do with time, right? Has to do with time. You say, oh, I'll do, you know, I'll love my wife always. I'm saying that, I'll, of all, at, you know, in all time, I'm going to love my wife. But if I said I'm going to do something always, I'm saying that I'm doing it all the way, all the way. So wherever we are, it's talking about distance, it's talking about travel, Okay, wherever we are, Jesus Christ says that I'm with you all way. Because he just finished saying, go to all nations. Okay, Christ is in Australia just as much as he is in some other nation that's, that, that, that's serving the Lord, right? Uh, and, and wherever we go, wherever we're accomplishing this great commission, Christ says that he's going to be with us all way, even until the end of the world. And so, of course, the end of the world in context of, of distance would be a place like Australia when Christ was talking there in Judea. You know, saying, so go, go to the end of the world. Yeah, Australia would be pretty far from that location. But baptism is the one that I'm going to be focusing on this morning. Now, in our statement of faith, we're going to have this written down. It says, I'll, I'll just read it to you. And, and again, I want your feedback. If you, if you don't like it, if you think it's, I don't know, if you don't agree with it, please let me know. Okay, because this is not necessarily my doctrinal statement, it should be the doctrinal statement of the church. It says, we believe that baptism is the immersion of a believer in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It is a public declaration and symbolism of a person's faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the means of salvation. Okay, so what is baptism? It's a public declaration that you've already placed your faith and trust on Jesus Christ, okay? Baptism represents the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. Being put under that water, it represents Christ's death. Coming out of that water represents Christ's resurrection. And so you're making a public declaration that your faith is on Christ and His finished work. It is not part of salvation. It is not part of the gospel. It is something that is done afterward as a public declaration, all right, if you can come with me to Luke chapter 3, come with me to Luke chapter 3 and verse number 21, Luke chapter 3 and verse number 21, we'll quickly look at the baptism of Jesus. Now, what I like about the baptism of Jesus is, again, it reinforces the fact that baptism is not a means of salvation. There are some people that teach you must be baptized in order to be saved. You know, there are many churches of Christ that teach this, but baptism is part of the gospel. But Jesus Christ got baptized. Did Jesus Christ need to be saved? Did Jesus Christ need forgiveness of sins? Of course not, okay? But it says here in Luke chapter 3, verse number 21, now this is about John the Baptist, and we are a Baptist church, so we're following after the tradition there of John the Baptist. It says, now when all the people were baptized, so I want to show you something that many people, several people are being baptized. It's a public declaration, right? It's not like they're just taking one person, you know, just secretly and doing it. No, when there's an opportunity for all people to be present, that's why they do it. When all people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized, okay? Jesus Christ, when he got baptized, there were others there to witness, to, 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 uh, uh, to, to, witness yeah, to give testimony of Christ's baptism. But there are several people there. And this is, what, again, why it ought to be a public declaration where others can witness this taking place. It says that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Wow. The Father was pleased at his Son for getting baptized. And for those of you that are getting baptized after service, the Father will be well pleased with you when you take that step of obedience. Okay. And again, what, what do we see here? We see Christ giving us the authority by the power of the name of the, of, the, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost to do baptisms. We see that when Christ got baptized, we see the, 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 the triune nature, the, the, the three in one. You know, the Father speaking from heaven. The Holy Ghost is sending upon Jesus and Jesus Christ, of course, being baptized. We see that triune, the Trinity, there all in this uh, time frame. And of course... You may recall we've been going through the book of John. When John saw this take place, he says, I bear record that this is the Son of God. Again, just publicly testifying of his experience. Say, hey, I, I've testified of Jesus Christ getting baptized and the great miracle that took place here in the voice of the Father saying that this is my beloved Son. Now come with me also to John chapter 3, if you can. 
We are going to bounce around. Remember when we're going through this statement of faith? We are, it's, it's pretty much a Bible study, okay? So you've got to get your fingers ready to go through the Bible, please. So John chapter 3 and verse number 23. John chapter 3 and verse number 23. We're going to quickly talk about the method of baptism. If you go to different churches, there are different forms of baptism. And, uh, you know, obviously the one that gets done the most, of course, is, comes from the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. And many Protestant churches have, of course, taken that on board. It's to baptize little babies. And when they baptize little children like that, they often do the sprinkling or the pouring. They get a little bit of water, right? just a little bit of that water there. And, sorry, brother, but a little bit of sprinkling right there. And then, well, he's baptized, you know? <laughs> you know no, no, no. That, that's, look, if that's all we need to get baptized, then this wouldn't make a lot of sense in John chapter 3, verse number 23. This is again about John the Baptist. It says, and John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem. Why? Why was he baptizing there? Because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So in order to get baptized, we must go to a place of much water. This is not much water. This is not much water. There is, you know, sprinkling or pouring does not fit the context. You know, in order to get baptized, John, look, when, when John says, all right, let's find a place to get baptized, let's find a place of much water, because as a Baptist church, the, the practice that we do and what is biblical is baptism by immersion. Getting that person completely under that water and coming completely out. Okay, now look, I've had, I've had several people actually ask me this question, so it's not really a foolish question. I say, what, what if I wasn't completely immersed? Like, what if my elbow was sticking out? Look, don't worry about it so much. Okay? <laughs> All right, it's, it's symbolic is what it is. Okay? It's symbolic of you, you know, having put your faith and trust on Jesus. If your nose was sticking out a little bit, nothing to panic about. Don't worry about it. Okay? But the point is we're trying to follow this procedure of finding much water for the purpose, of course, of being immersed. How do we know that it's immersion that took place? Maybe they're just looking for much water because there was much sprinkling to be done. I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so, but, you know, even if you go back to the Greek, the word bapti to baptize, baptism, you know, comes from the Greek word baptizo, baptizo, which, according to the Greeks, do we have any Greeks here? According to the Greeks, that means immersion, being completely covered. That's what it means in the Greek, baptizo. In fact, this is why the Roman Catholic Church had a split, and then you've got the Orthodox Church that came out of it, is because the Greeks understood, just by their language, that baptizo means immersion. And they would not agree with the Catholics doing the sprinkling or pouring, but said, no, we need to go and, 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 and immerse people that, you know, or, you know, little children. And they still do it wrong because they immerse little children, okay? And, and what they, they do, they, get, they kind of get the little baby and they, they, it, they say it in the name of the, the father, they dunk the child in once, and of the son, they dunk the child in again, and of the Holy Ghost, and they dunk that child in again three times. That's ridiculous. Three times? That doesn't make a lot of sense, and I'll explain to you why that doesn't make... In fact, I'll explain this to you now. I've got verses later on. But if baptism is to represent our faith and trust on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, how many times did Jesus Christ have to die and be buried and rise from the dead? Three times? No, just once. Okay? Once for all, it's complete. It's done the moment Christ died. And so when we do baptisms, we don't do it one, two, three. We do it once because it represents Christ's death and resurrection is what it represents. Okay? So even though the Greek Orthodox kind of got it right, that it's by immersion, they've got everything else wrong. <laughs> I mean, obviously the, obviously, the most important thing that they got wrong, of course, like the Roman Catholics, is a false gospel. All right, if you can come with me to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 35. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 35. And this is, of course, the famous passage on Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, now we see who gets baptized. Who is it that should get baptized? And also what's covered here is how, how, you know, how early should I get baptized? You know, at, at what point should I get baptized? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 8, verse number 35. Acts chapter 8, verse number 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Brethren, what is the gospel? Is, is Philip here preaching baptism to the Ethiopian eunuch? All right. Ethiopia, in order for you to get saved, you must get baptized. Is he preaching, hey, in order for you to get saved, you need to turn from all your sins and live a good life. You've got to keep the commandments. No, he says, look, he preached unto him Jesus. All right, and brethren, just remind yourself, when you go and preach the gospel, the, the, the core message is Jesus. Okay, don't get sidetracked. 
It's very easy to get sidetracked when you're trying to give the gospel. People start asking questions, and you think you've got to answer all the questions. Look, just bring it back to Jesus. Bring it all back to Jesus, and keep it going, okay? So he preached unto Jesus, verse number 36, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Or what he's saying is, what prevents me from being baptized? He goes, I want to get baptized. What's stopping me from getting baptized, Philip? What does Philip say? Verse number 37. And Philip said, if thou believest, in fact, let me just, before I read that, your modern Bibles don't have this verse. They remove this verse out of the equation. Okay? But the answer is, verse number 37, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Thou mayest. You know what's going to allow you to get baptized? If you believe in Jesus with all your heart. With all your heart. Not, oh, well, some of my heart believes in Jesus and some of my heart believes in my good works. No. Or some of my heart is on Jesus and, and, and some of my heart is on my church to get me to heaven. No, you've got to believe with all thine heart. Okay? It's not saying, hey, put the, ah, yeah, with all my heart I believe in Jesus. I'm going to put a great effort in. No, just with all your faith, all your heart that's in your faith. Even if your faith is the size of a mustard seed, you'd put it all on Jesus and Jesus Christ alone, the finished work of salvation. Then thou mayest be baptized. So who gets baptized? Little babies? They don't know the gospel. <laughs> little babies don't have, don't have the understanding. How can you baptize little babies when they haven't believed on Christ with all of their heart? Of course, that is incorrect. The moment you have trusted, as soon as you're someone that have placed your faith on Jesus Christ, you say, yes, I've done that, Pastor, you know, then you may get baptized. That's the next step, baptism. You say, how quickly should I get baptized? Well, oh, well, I didn't finish verse number 37. And he answered, Ethiopian eunuch answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So does he believe in Christ? Absolutely. Verse number 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both, look at this, they went down both into the water. Look, if this is how you get baptized by this cup and sprinkling, I don't know how you're going to get into that water. I, I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> okay, they find a place, obviously, with much water, with how you can both go into that water. And it says, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Listen, the Ethiopian eunuch did not need a 12-step program you know, before he got baptized, right? The Ethiopian eunuch did not have to get to a certain time in his life to get baptized. He didn't, you know, Philip didn't need to, well, hold on, let me just observe you for a few years. Let me make sure that you're truly a believer. Let me make sure that you're truly following Jesus Christ the way that you ought to. Let me make sure that you're just truly living for the Lord. And then when I'm satisfied, then I'll baptize you. No, you baptize him straight away. The moment he's made a confession of faith, yes, my belief is on Jesus, the Son of God. Then he commanded the chariot to stand still. All right, let's get baptized. There is no delay. There is no wait. You know, ideally, the time to get baptized is as soon as possible. As soon as possible. It is a public declaration that you have trusted Christ. It is not a public declaration that you started attending church. It's not a public declaration that you finished reading the Bible cover to cover. It's not a public declaration that you're now trying to live godly and righteously. No, it's a public declaration that your faith is on Christ, the Son of God. And once you have done that, yes, you are permitted to get baptized. You know, if a child comes up to me, let's say eight years old, and say, Pastor, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know it's, it's, it's salvation. Going to heaven is based on Him and Him alone, His death, burial, and resurrection. And I have eternal life. I can never lose that. Can I get baptized? What's going to be my response? Well, let's wait till you're 12 years old. Pastors say that. No. Okay. Based on your confession of faith, based on your faith on, on the Lord, okay, I will baptize you. All right? And you say, well, hold on, Pastor. What if later on we find out that they're just repeating words and they never trusted Christ? Okay. Well, okay, they got wet. They got wet the first time. What do you find out that child actually was never saved and, and he finally, something dawned on him when he was 15 years old, let's say, and he goes, you know what? I never really truly put my faith in Christ. You know, I never really understood what I was doing. I, I, my, my faith was still in my good works. My faith was still in, in church or whatever it was. All right, now that they have trusted Christ, let's get them baptized for real. The first time was a little, they got a little wet. 
doesn't matter. You get, we'll get baptized now after you've trusted Christ. But I, I, look, I'm not going to wait. And, and look, someone wants to get baptized, as long as they've confessed Christ to me, their faith is on Him and Him alone, then you can get baptized. We can stop, stop the chariot immediately. Let's go get baptized. Okay? All right, come with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Actually, um, can you come with me to Colossians? Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Sorry about that. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Because 1 Corinthians 15, you all know it very well, I'm sure. Which I'll read it to you very quickly. When we talk about the gospel, we talk about someone's faith on the gospel, on Jesus Christ. This is what we're talking about. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, it says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Now this is important. This is the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. All right, where did he die? On the cross. And then it says, and that he was buried. All right, where was he buried? In that grave. And that he was buried uh, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. This is what you're trusting in. Okay? Yes, you're trusting Christ and by extension you're trusting his shed blood. You're trusting his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection from the dead. Now, if you're there in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1 verse number 20, let's have a look what it says here. Colossians chapter 1 verse number 20, because as I said to you, baptism represents the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, right? When you're standing out of the water, when you're standing up, getting ready to get baptized, that pictures the death of Christ, okay? Death as Christ died on the cross, he was upright when he died. And then when you're taken into the water, you're buried, okay? Buried like he was in the grave. And then, you know, we know that Christ was in the grave three days and three nights, but I'm not going to hold you down that long, all right? Maybe three seconds max, okay? <laughs> then you're coming out of that water to picture the resurrection of Christ, okay? This is what baptism is. This is why sprinkling and pouring does not convey the message. Like when you're going to bury a dead body, you're not going to just sprinkle a bit of dirt on it. Okay, now you're going to immerse that body completely six feet under, and that's what baptism is, and then you come out of the water, okay, and that represents the resurrection of Christ. What is the significance of these three things? Well, you're in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 20, what is the significance of the death of Christ? It says there in verse number 20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross. You see, Christ has given us peace with God by his death on the cross. That's the significance, okay? This is God saying, hey, I want to have peace with man. Instead of you being rebellious, my enemies, those that are just openly rejecting me, I'm offering you my son to die in your place. I'm, I'm giving you peace. I'm giving you a way to be, be made right with me. It says, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, Look at verse number 21, before we were saved, it says, and you that were some time, there was, there was some time in the past that this was you, alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now have he reconciled. Amazing, your wicked works made you an enemy, an alien to God, but now you've been, made recon you've been reconciled to him. Look at this, verse number 22, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and reprovable in His sight. Wow, what an exchange. That by the body of His flesh through death, the death of the cross right there, the death of His body, God has extended peace toward us. Okay? And not just paid for our sins. We know, of course, that when Christ died, all our sins were imputed upon Him. He became sin for us. He became the curse for us. But we often forget the exchange. Christ gives us His righteousness. This is why you don't go to heaven by your own righteousness. It's not like, some people think this, this when they think of the, of, the, of the Bible, they think this, and this is, false, this is a false gospel. They think, all right, the moment you've trusted Christ by faith, okay, all of your sins from today and your past have been forgiven, but now you've got to do your part from tomorrow and live a righteous life in order to make sure you're going to heaven. Or if you don't do it, you'll lose your salvation. No, no, you got it all wrong. Yes, Christ did pay for all of our sins, but not just today's sins and yesterday's sins, 
but even tomorrow's sins. All the sins is paid for them all. Okay? And not only that, then He gives us His righteousness. So we live in His righteousness. When God the Father looks at us, He sees us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is why you're not going to be perfect tomorrow. This is why you're not going to be sinless tomorrow. There will come a time when you're sinless, of course. That will come when you, get your, you receive your new resurrected bodies. But it says here to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. You were once an enemy to God, but now He sees you holy, unblameable, all right? No sins, your sins have been covered by the death of our Lord. All right, and uh, very quickly I'll read to you from, if you can come back, you come back, you go to Matthew 12, please. Go to Matthew 12, and I'll quickly read to you in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. You go to Matthew 12, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. It says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, His body died for us, His blood redeems us, washes us from sins. And of course, this is why when Christ, you know, we're looking at one ordinance here, but another ordinance that Christ gives the church is the Lord's Supper. And He gives us that grape juice that represents His blood and the bread that represents His body. And He says, you know, this do uh, in remembrance of me. You know, this is in, you know, in remembrance of His death. You know, the, the broken body and the shed blood. And of course, this is, the, this is the significance of the death of Christ, that we've been cleansed, that God has reached out and given us peace. Now, you're there in Matthew chapter 12. Let's think about the significance of his burial, okay? Like, why did Christ have to be buried for three days? Well, number one, well, let's have a look at it here, okay? Matthew chapter 12, verse number 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas, or Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay? The significance of three days and three nights, number one, is that Christ was fulfilling prophecy. Okay? Christ was fulfilling the scriptures, okay? He came to fulfill the law. And as I've, I've said to you many times, you've got to look for Christ in the Bible. You know, even the picture of Jonah being swallowed by a way is, is, a, is a type, it's a foreshadowing, it's a picture of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is fulfilling the fact that Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights, okay? That's number one. But number two, you know, why didn't Christ just die on the cross and let's say five minutes passes and then God just raises him from the dead? You know, he awakens off the cross or something like that. Well, the reason for that, you know, and this, I guess this is my opinion, but I believe it's correct anyway, is that, you know, if Christ just rose from the dead five minutes later, is that people could just turn around and say, well, maybe he wasn't really dead. Okay, maybe he just passed out and now he's just been revived. Maybe he was just in a brief coma and now he's just woken out of that coma. No, three days is a good time to determine this man is dead and there's no life in him. Okay, there is nothing like that. So, of course, the three days, you know, being taken into a tomb and, and being buried there. Actually, come with me to Matthew 27. Come with me to Matthew 27, verse number 62. Matthew 27, verse number 62. The significance of his burial is to, to confirm his death, to confirm that he truly died. Okay, Matthew 27, verse number 62. Now, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, this is the next day after uh, the, the crucifixion, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said while he was yet alive, so they said, look, he's not alive anymore, okay? But they recognize he's dead. After three days, I will rise again. So they, they know what Christ spoke about, that he was expecting to rise from the dead after three days. Verse number 64, Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. So they say to Pilate, Look, if these, these disciples come and take his body, steal his body away, then they can start claiming that he rose from the dead. Things are going to be much worse for us than it was before. Okay? So, so obviously, these chief priests, these Pharisees, they are, they're, they're confirming themselves that Christ is dead. Okay? They know this, and they're worried that the body is going to be taken away, and the disciples are going to pretend that Jesus Christ is alive. So verse number 65, Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as ye can. 
So Pilate says, all right, get some security guards, I don't know, get some watchmen there to make sure that nobody enters, nobody can go in, and also seal that stone. Make it as sure as you can. Verse number 66, so they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So they have watchmen, let's say security guards, making sure nobody can come to this place. And they also seal the stone. I don't know how they seal it exactly, but they reinforce it so no man can open it. Okay? All right. Let's go to the next chapter. Matthew chapter 28, please. Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 1. Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 1. It says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rode back the stone from the door and sat upon it. I mean, I don't know how they sealed that stone, <laughs> okay? But the angel of the Lord comes and has no problem rolling that stone away, <laughs> right? Just showing you the power of God there, right? Verse number three. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment was white as snow. That's the angel. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. So you can see the keepers are still there. The watchmen are still there. All right? But they became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. You know, the angel came and rolled that stone away. He, did, he didn't do it so Jesus could come out. Jesus has already left. He did it for the, uh, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, to come and be a witness that the body was gone. They were a witness that the, st the stone was in place. It's been moved, and after it was moved, the body's gone. Christ was already resurrected from the dead. And look, the sepulchre, the grave, this burial site was not preventing him from escaping. Okay, look, we see the power of Jesus Christ able to, I don't know, phase through or transport himself through the walls. It's not going to stop God, okay? In his resurrected body, he's able to do such a miracle. And of course, you know, these ladies and, and of course several other disciples and even this, what, these watchmen, they're all witnesses that the body's gone. They're all witnesses, of course, that Christ rose from the dead. And then Christ would, of course, again, reveal himself to several of his disciples, 500 at one time. And so the significance of his burial is the confirmation that he was dead. He was dead. Three days and three nights, meaning that on, by the fourth day, there's no longer death. Okay? <laughs> he had rise, risen from the dead. Come with me to 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, lights and internet now. Anyway, you guys can hear me preach. Aircon's on. All right, doesn't matter. 1 Corinthians 15, please. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 13. What is the significance of his resurrection? So, you know, we already got confirmation that Christ has died for us. All right? We have confirmation that he was buried. And, of course, we talked a little bit little about his resurrection. But what is the significance of his resurrection? What if Christ was not resurrected from the dead? You know, is that sufficient? Is that sufficient for our salvation? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 13, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 13, it says this, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. Now, what Paul is speaking about here, if there is no resurrection of the dead, he's speaking about the, our resurrection, the resurrection of believers. If there's no resurrection of the believers, with the rapture, okay, we believe in the rapture, we believe in the resurrection, but if that is not to take place, then Christ is not risen. In other words, Christ's resurrection guarantees our resurrection. Christ's resurrection guarantees new resurrected bodies made like unto Jesus Christ. That is a significance. Verse number 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Brethren, if Christ was not resurrected, then this preaching is vain right now. It's empty, worthless. What are you doing here this morning if Christ was not resurrected? Your faith is in vain. What are you guys doing? Go do something else. Go do what everyone else on the Sunshine Coast is doing this Sunday morning, whatever they're doing. Okay? Because this is all vain if Christ did not rise from the dead. The fact that you're here this morning, you know, proves to us, you know, guarantees that your faith is real in the resurrected Savior. 
But he continues there in verse number 15. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God. Okay, if Christ was not resurrected, then we're false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. He goes, we're witnessing that God raised him from the dead, but if he was not raised, then we have no resurrection, then we're false witnesses. It's funny that the JWs, you know, they call themselves Jehovah Witnesses. But they don't believe Christ resurrected bodily from the grave. They don't believe. They believe he resurrected spiritually, but they don't believe he resurrected bodily. They don't believe in the resurrection. Okay? They don't believe in the resurrection. So what are they? According to Paul here, they are false witnesses of God. Because they're saying Christ did not raise bodily, but the Bible says no, he rose bodily. Okay? Verse number 16. For if the dead rise not, then it is not Christ raised. And look at verse number 17. And if, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Look at this. Ye are yet in your sins. See, the significance of Christ rising from the dead is, it is he's showing that he has victory. Victory over sins. Victory over death. Victory over hell. Victory over the grave. That's what the resurrection represents. Christ's victory over the sins that he went to pay for. Without Christ's resurrection, there is no victory for our sins. We are yet in our sins. It is so important that Christ rose from the dead. And then verse number 18. Then they also which have fallen asleep, or those that have passed away, in Christ are perished. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then all believers that have died, they're all perishing in hell right now. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So if Christ did not rise from the dead, there's no resurrection, and we only have this life to live, then it says here we're the most miserable people on earth. If Christ did not rise from the dead, your faith is in vain, your, this preaching is in vain, you're still yet in your sins, and you're just miserable, miserable people. Why are you here on Sunday morning? Miserable people? No, you're not miserable people. You're children of God. Because, of course, indeed, Christ did rise from the dead. Verse number 20. But now if Christ... But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. So Christ is the firstfruits. Okay, he's the first that resurrected bodily from the dead. And then it says in verse number 22. For as in Adam all die. Yeah, we're all going to die because of Adam's... Uh, the, the sin nature that was passed on from Adam, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards, so Christ is the first to rise from the dead bodily, in a new resurrected body, okay? It says, afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Are you of Christ? Well, you're going to rise from the dead too. You're going to be resurrected as well at his coming, at the rapture. Okay, so that's the promise. That's the significance of the resurrection. Christ's victory over sin and the promise of our resurrection, a new resurrected body that will be without sin. All right. So when we talk about putting our, doing baptisms, okay, it is all symbolic of this truth that our faith is on the completed work of Jesus Christ. Come with me to uh, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, please. Acts chapter 16. This is a very popular verse that I, I, I often use when I go soul winning. I'm sure many of you use it as well. Acts 16 verse 30. I'm just reinforcing the when here. When should we get baptized? Have you put your faith and trust on the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Is your faith that Christ has overcome sin? That you've been cleansed from sin because of his work? Verse, Acts 16, verse 30. And brought them out, this is the Philippian jailer, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What's the, what's the must? Okay? And they said, get baptized. And they said, go to church. And they said, repent of all your sins. And they said, keep the Ten Commandments. And they said, live a holy life. No, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 
and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. His house is his family. Girls, if you and your family, because they went to, to the Philippian jailer's house, if you and your family believe on Jesus Christ, you'll be saved, thou shalt be saved. Praise God for that. But look at verse number 32. And as they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house, and he took them, so all in his house, so this would be, I guess, man, let's say he's married, he's got people in his house, I suppose he's married, I suppose he has children, he might very well have servants in his house, okay? Hey, they're preaching to all in the house. Verse number 33, look at this, and he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, look at this, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway, or as we would say it, straight away, in the same hour, the same hour that they believed on Jesus Christ, they were then taken to get baptized, straight away. They were not told, all right, you've got to go to church and sit down with the pastor and go through a 20-week series uh, you know, covering the, the fundamentals of the faith, you know, before you can get baptized. No, same hour. I don't know how, you, how much can you teach in an hour? Okay? In an hour. I mean, look, for those of you that are experienced soul winners, okay, okay, one-on-one is going to be quicker than a household of people, okay, because you're trying to explain to everybody in the household. You'll easily, presenting the gospel, take half an hour to an hour, okay, <laughs> depending on the kinds of questions that might be coming up from several people in the household, Easily, in that hour, you'll be preaching the whole gospel, okay? You won't have time for anything else, okay? You'll be taking them, all right, you've trusted Christ. You know, what must I do to be saved? Believe, all right? Then, straight away, you can get baptized, the moment you've trusted Christ. I just want to make that very clear, and that's the principle I have. If someone says to me, Pastor, I want to get baptized, look, I may not get, be able to get you baptized immediately on the same hour, okay? <laughs> but definitely, by the next church service, we can make it happen. Okay, I don't, want, I don't want to delay for unnecessary reasons or anything like that, okay? But I think that's biblical. I think that is the right way. There are several times we see this taking place immediately. There's no delay. Man, woman, and child, doesn't matter, everybody in the household that has trusted Christ, they got baptized straight away. Come with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Now, we've understood that baptism represents or, or symbolizes the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, that we have publicly put our faith upon that. But there's also something further that you need to understand here. It is often said, you've probably often heard it said, and it is true that baptism is the first step of obedience. Okay? The first step. The moment you get saved, you're born again, you become a child of God, the very first step of obedience is baptism. Okay, I mean, if you're getting baptized the same hour of hearing the gospel, there were no other steps you could take. <laughs> okay, that is step number one, right? If you have been eunuch, as soon as he asks, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, immediately they command that chariot to stop, they go down and get baptized. Okay, it's the first step that we see in the Bible. Now, what is this, why is this the first step? In what sense? Well, Romans chapter 6, verse number 1, okay, and this is important, because sometimes when I... I want to be, look, I want to be so clear on the gospel that there is no confusion where I stand, okay? You don't have to turn from sins to be saved, okay? That is a work. That is a good work to do, but good works don't save you. Coming to church is a good work to do. Getting baptized is a good work to do, but none of these works save you. But once you are saved, Romans chapter 6, verse number 1, Hey, we're to teach all things, remember? To observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you. Well, Romans chapter 6, verse number 1 says this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So once you are saved, say, Pastor, all right, I know salvation is not turning from my sins. So should I just continue in my sin? Because grace, God's grace abounds. All right, well, verse number 2. God forbid... How shall we live that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Listen, the moment you've been saved, Christ has paid for your sins. They were nailed to that cross. Christ died for you. 
That part of you, that fleshly part of you is dead with Christ. Now it gives you the new man, born again. The born again spirit. We're to walk in the spirit. Brethren, we're to walk in holiness. God forbid that you should continue your sins. Yeah, turn from your sins. Yeah, repent from your sins. To be saved? No, not to be saved. Okay? But this is what we should be striving to do after we're saved, after we're given the new man. Because now we have the ability through the Holy Spirit to live after Christ. Verse number three. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Notice that. So baptism isn't just symbolic of the death of Christ, but it's symbolic of your death to self, your death to this flesh, your death to this sinful nature. You say, that is not me anymore. That part of me dies, that old man. But we've got to do it every day, actually. The Bible says to do it daily, you know, to mortify that flesh daily, to crucify that old man, because that old man loves to come back. Okay, every time you sin, that old man rose from the dead again. You've got to go and crucify him again. Okay, but the baptism represents, you know what, I'm no longer living after that old man. It's done. Okay? Is that salvation, though? Is salvation, I'm no longer going to live after the old man. That is not salvation. We're talking about baptism after salvation. Now, that represents the fact that I'm putting away that old man, I'm going to try to live after that new man, the born-again spirit that I have. Because it says there in verse number 4, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see, it's the first step of obedience, baptism. You come out of the water, you say, now I'm going to walk in newness of life. Not that old life, not that old flesh, not that sinful nature. Now I'm going to try to live in accordance to God's ways. Live in accordance with His Spirit. The newness of life. Brethren, we're called a New Life Baptist Church. It comes from this passage. The goal is to live in newness of life. You know, not that we should continue in sin. Are you going to continue in sin? Are you going to continue sinning? Unfortunately, yes, you will. Okay, till the day you die, because that old flesh is still here. Still here. Okay, it's still here. It frustrates me. <laughs> Frustra hey, but it's the only flesh I've got. It's the body I've got. It's got to be in subjection to the Holy Spirit. It's got to be in subjection to the new man. Then God can use this body for his purposes. Okay, we don't want to destroy this body too quickly. It's got a sinful nature, yes, but it can be used by God as long as it's, it's submissive to his will, submissive to the new man, submissive to the Holy Spirit. Okay, and when we do that with so the body that we've been given, we should walk in newness of life. Remember, we're new life at this church because, yes, you know, we want to be clear on salvation, we don't want to muddy, muddy the waters at all. If you muddy the waters of salvation, you've got a false gospel. But I also want to, you know, I, I don't want to neglect this part as well that we're commanded to walk in newness of life. Your life ought to be different, okay, and the first step ought to be baptism. You know, I was saved when I was four years old. Childlike faith. Christ says, unless you be converted like little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Okay, yeah, little children can be saved. And, you know, I went to church and, yeah, learned things, but I, this is my testimony, and I've heard many people share similar testimonies like this. I did not really grow until I got baptized. Even though I went to, when did I get baptized? I think I was 20 or 21. And I got saved when I was four. Okay? And I was going to a Baptist church. Say, so why didn't you get baptized? I did not understand baptism. Number one, I was a little bit timid to go in front of everybody. Get, because in the church, I was, they had a baptismal thing in front of the whole congregation. I was too timid to do that, number one. But number two, I was sure that when I got baptized, God's going to call me to be a missionary in the middle of Africa. And I didn't want to do it. Because <laughs> that's what I thought baptism was. It was like, all right, Lord, whatever you want now. <laughs> so I was, I was scared about that. I didn't want to go to Africa. Thank the Lord he sent me to the Sunshine Coast. 
like completely different. <laughs> okay? If I knew that, I would have got baptized a long time ago. But I didn't understand it. Okay? But what he represents, of course, not just that you place your faith on him, but you're making a public commitment now that, you know what, I'm going to try to live godly. I'm going to try to live righteously. I'm going to try to live up that new man. You know? and, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing to make that public confession. Now, no, none of us are going to be perfect at it. We all know we're going to mess up life and you know, make mistakes, but at the same time, we shouldn't just be like, oh, I sinned again, oh well. No, no, we saw earlier, shall we, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You know, God wants us to live a life that pleases Him. Uh, 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 you know, even though we don't have a resurrected body, we still have the new man within us. God has given us the ability to live holy and righteously. He's given us the ability, the power, the victory over sin that has come through Christ Jesus. We have the ability to overcome temptations so we don't sin in His sight. And of course, when you do sin, the thing you should do is go to the Lord, say, Lord, please forgive me. You know, I'm messed up again. Please give me the victory over this sinful flesh. All right, one more passage, please. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. In conclusion... Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. This passage, again, just reinforces the fact that people get baptized immediately. That is a biblical way to do things. But there's one other point that I want to draw out of this. Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. Then they that gladly received His word were baptized. You know, for those of you getting baptized today, have you gladly received His word? You know what? Baptism is something joyful, something that should give you gladness. You know what? Yes, I'm so thankful that I believed His Word. I'm so thankful that I believed the Gospel. I can't wait to get baptized. It's not always like that. Like, like me, I was kind of timid, a bit shy, maybe you're feeling that way, a little nervous. But what we see here is when you gladly receive the Bible, receive the Gospel, I should say, you, you get baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's pretty public baptism. Having three people present, 3,000 3, people getting baptized, let alone who's watching. Okay? That's a big, I don't know how long that it would take to baptize 3,000 people. I don't think there was one person doing it. There would have been several, of course, doing the baptisms. But it is something that is glad. It is something that, is, that should give us great joy. This is why when it comes to the Great Commission, this makes me the most excited. Okay? Because, I mean, it's all great. Getting someone saved is the best part, you know, someone going to heaven. But what gets me excited in ministry is baptism because we don't get to do it every day. We don't get to do it every week. And so this is a time of rejoicing. And I really do appreciate those that are willing to make that public confession that you've trusted Christ after the service. All right. In summary, the statement of faith once again is going to say this. In, under baptism, we believe that baptism is the immersion of a believer in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it is a public declaration and symbolism of a person's faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the means of salvation. Okay, let's pray.